Hi, my name is Scott, the Miniature Maniac, and today I have two absolute beginners with me, and they're going to ask me every single question they have about miniature painting while assembling some Tyranids. What up, Mini Family? These are my friends. Hi, my name's Curtis. Hi, my name is Nick. And like I said in the intro, we're working on Tyranid Hormigons for Curtis's army. And the premise for today's video is going to be, we're going to go through each section of a typical miniature painting workload. We're gonna talk about it, answer questions about it, and come up with a paint scheme for Curtis's army. I have painted very few models in the past. In fact, I've only painted two models in total. I've painted two little knobs, and uh, I wasn't confident enough to paint anything more than that, even though I had quite a few ogre models that I had purchased and assembled. I have never bought or painted a mini, but I have watched a lot of YouTube about it, but never actually done anything with them. Okay, so the first step in all miniature painting procedures is to assemble and clean the models. Now, most models that you'll find from Games Workshop come in plastic material, but you can also find models that come in both pewter, a soft white metal, and resin. I would say resin is probably the most ubiquitous material you'll find outside of large companies like GW because it's the easiest to do. Plastic requires a lot of expensive tooling that small companies don't have access to. Is it any more difficult to paint metal? Uh, sometimes metal will chip more easily than plastic or resin uh, when you like drop it or scrape it yeah, and stuff like that. But generally speaking, once something is primed, it's pretty much the same. When you open a GW box, you'll find sprues that have all the parts on them, and it's our job to clip them out, all the parts you want for our individual models, and assemble them. And in this case, since we're using plastic minis, we're gonna use plastic glue. But if we were using resin or pewter minis, we'd use super glue. I'm assuming I put the flat side of these oh. against the actual piece. Yes, so that's a great question. So we're using side cutters. In these side cutters, you wanna put the flat piece all up against the piece. You're cutting off the majority of the sprue, leaving as little behind as possible. All right, now that all the pieces are clipped out, we're going to clean them. We're going to remove the mold lines and also the extra bit of sprue that remained on there from when we clipped it out. And the tool we're going to use to do that is an X-Acto knife. And, you know, they can be dangerous. You can cut them, you can cut yourself with it, so be careful with it. People will use uh, safer tools, but, you know, we're adults. <laughs> can you handle a knife? Are you going to cut yourself, boys? You're calling me an Hopefully. adult right now? <laughs> My favorite thing about the miniature hobby is assembling the models I know it sounds silly, but I actually really enjoy taking them off the sprues, cleaning up the mold lines, and gluing them together and seeing them come together. And maybe that's my favorite part of it, my favorite step of it, because I haven't really done the painting step of it. But I really find a zen in like scraping away mold lines and just kind of getting into a groove and, and maybe like putting some on the background and just kind of chilling and vibing and working on my models. What I want you to do is I want you to look around the model and look for a little plastic seam that occurs when the two halves of the mold are pressed together and injected with plastic. A little bead will appear around the perimeter of the model. And a nice cheat to figure out where that line is always going to be is if you think about the sprue and how it's laid out. This is uh, pressed together between two mold halves like this. So the mold line is going to run around this, right. this uh, horizon. Okay. Okay. So, if you so that's on, where they meet. Exactly. So now with your your little exacto knife, mm -hmm. run around the edge and scrape away. So have the knife perpendicular to the mold line, and scrape away the little mold line, just so you get that get rid of that. Uh, do you have a file I could use? Yes, absolutely. So you don't only need to use an exacto knife when cleaning up. There are many tools you can use. Uh, like Perfect. files, for instance, or sanding twigs that have a little bit more flexibility to them and are oh. nice for things like curves but aren't as aggressive as files. The one problem with files is that they kind of leave a little bit of a finish once you're done using them. You can see the scrapes from the file. Okay, that's or, fair. Yeah. yeah. Whereas an X-Acto knife is a little bit, at least a little bit smoother of a finish, which is why it's my default too. But for certain areas, a file is definitely useful. Have you ever like taken this and like accentuated like these wear marks? Like yeah. kind of get a little more depth or something especially for like vehicles and stuff you can really take a knife and like gouge out corners like certain projectiles took out chunks of armor or in this case like chunks of carapace because we're dealing with tyranids so they have a like carapace for their armor so every single part's gonna have a mold line on it and so what i like to do in terms of order of operations is i like to clean every single part individually and then uh, i like to assemble it 
You can, if you want to, to have a more expedited approach, you can assemble the whole model and then clean the mold lines. And the reason why that's faster is because sometimes when you assemble the models, you'll obscure certain mold lines and they will no longer be visible right, to you. Right. So there's no point in cleaning those ones, right? You don't waste your time on ones that aren't actually visible. Yeah, but I feel like this method is just a little bit more thorough and a little bit more beginner friendly. Do you ever paint them in pieces, then assemble them? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, he does that all the time. That's called sub-assembly painting. And for things like this, for like army uh, like army models, especially like the grunt ones, which you're going to paint like 40 of at mm -hmm. least, right. I would never paint in sub-assemblies. Like every time that I think I've finished a piece, I find another one more. <laughs> I know. What's an appropriate amount of time to spend on this? We'll However long, long you want. want. Sometimes mold lines run across areas of texture, like hair. Yeah, it's running fur. across the ridge here. Yeah, that can be a little tricky on how to deal with that. Right, because if you scrape away too much, you're going like, to get away all the detail, I would assume. And unfortunately, there isn't really a good answer for how to deal with mold lines that run across texture. I think the best answer is just to do a little bit of both. Scrape away a little bit of the mold line, but not so much that you lose the texture and kind of chalk it up to be an L because anything else is just you know a little bit too intense for models that you're going to do a lot of. Sometimes you might have plastic shavings that are kind of like stuck on the model. And just like you're doing right there, I'll blow them away uh, sometimes. Or if they're really stuck on there, you can take your plastic glue, which you'll eventually use for assembly, but we're not there yet. And with a very kind of light brush, you can brush over the areas where there are plastic shavings and they melt down and go away instantly, leaving you with a very nice clean surface. Oh. You guys are gonna hate me with how much longer I take to do this than you. So that please, if you're gonna yell at me, do it now. <laughs> oh my God, Curtis, <laughs> shake it forever. I have a feeling I'm gonna take quite some time. As well. Okay, okay, then I feel less bad. That's okay. Taking long is fine. There's nothing wrong with taking a long, a long time. Uh, one of the things that's really nice about the miniature hobby is just like you can just fucking chill out and just paint and assemble the models, listen to some good music, hang out with some good buds, and just. Have fun. There's no need to rush. Okay, so the one thing I see with you, Nick, is that you're seeing these little white lines right here. Mm -hmm. And that typically indicates that when you're dragging your knife, and I can see it here in the texture here, when you're dragging your knife across the mold line, it's actually skipping mm -hmm. instead of just gliding across it. And when it skips, it creates these little jagged lines as opposed to being nice and smooth. Uh, so make sure when you're when you're dragging your mold line that you're it's nice and consistent. It's not skipping at all and creating those little divots. Sometimes that happens when the knife is dull. Other times it just happens. Um, it can happen because of the angle that you hold your knife to the mold line. It's all about just adjusting, but just be aware of it that when you're okay. scraping, it might skip a little bit. So to fix this, I'll just take a little file. I'll hog away some of that uh, some of those little divots. I noticed it was happening a lot more on that large flat surface because yeah. there's more of the knife touching. Especially uh, convex surfaces like this that are angled inwards, it happens a lot with. You gotta be kind of mindful about the angle of the blade to the model. I say this not to be anal retentive, but just so that you're aware of why certain things are happening. A lot of times, and this is a massive caveat to everything I'm gonna say in this video, it may sound like I'm being anal retentive, but you can choose to ignore what I'm saying about these finer details. And honestly, once the model is painted, based on the table, playing with it, you won't care and no one else will care if the underside of its claw has a little texture. Yeah. No one's going to care, mm -hmm. so just don't worry about it. Look, Scott, I'm going to care, okay? <laughs> I'm going to know it's there. I'm going to be playing with it and the whole time. I'm just going to be thinking about that one spot underneath that you can't see. <laughs> that one horror god has texture on his claw. And fucking, everybody knows. Fucking Fred. <laughs> with that part complete. Now it's time for a message. From our sponsor. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't have a personal gallery for my miniature painting art, so when Squarespace reached out to me to sponsor a video, I took this as an opportunity to use their platform to build a dedicated gallery for myself. A gallery like this is useful for a number of reasons. For those who don't know what miniature painting is, I'm looking at you, Aunt Amy. This shows them in a succinct, beautiful way. Importing images and dealing with alignment is made easy and all the while creating a website that just looks awesome. It's important that your gallery show your work while also being functional and beautiful itself. If I need to see a bigger resolution of this miniature so I can see the creamy blends, it's as simple as double clicking. If you want to save some fat stacks on making a miniature art gallery for yourself, head to squarespace.com slash miniac to save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain using the code miniac at checkout. 
Now that all of our pieces are cleaned and clipped off to the sprue, we're going to glue them together and we're going to use Tamiya Thin Plastic Cement to do that. And there are a few ways to use this glue. Uh, you could use it in a very typical way where you put the glue on the part and then put the part next to it. And then after 15 seconds, it'll dry mostly so it's uh, stands still. Or for parts like this, where it's two halves of the head, you can hold the two halves together where they're going to end up being and then run the little brush applicator inside along the seam. And the glue is so thin that it'll uh, go right down into the recess uh, and pretty much dry immediately, gluing those two halves together. Do either of those methods uh, turn out better, or do you have a preference for one of them? Yeah, so I feel like those two methods lend themselves to what type of part you're trying to put together. So, so like for, for the head, it would make sense to do what you've just done, where you're running along the, yeah. Exactly, okay. but for like the arm, this little hole right here, it makes sense just to put some glue right in that hole and then stick the okay. arm in there. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then after they're glued together, do you do like <clears throat> further refinement of the lines, or? Yeah, so if you realize that once the model is glued together, okay. And there are things like gaps or things like extra mold lines that you miss. Once the glue is fully cured, you can then go back and shave those okay. away. No problem. So this model uh, has a slotted base, but not all models you find will have slotted bases. Some of them will just glue on top of a flat base with a flat part to a flat base connection. Uh, but in this case, we're using slots, and that's, that's fine. It's just two types of things you might see. See, this is a part where I would like, almost consider yeah. like, like this painting this thing, like. off. No, no. No? Yeah, so, okay, here's the thing. When people are enthusiastic about something, they try to come up with solutions to things they perceive to be problems. But in the reality, the things you're trying to solve aren't actual problems. So if you paint the thing in sub-assemblies, it's going to be more difficult to paint. You have to create painting handles for each upper yeah, part. more tedious. You're going to paint things that aren't going to be seen, really, and you're going to spend maybe like 30% longer than you might normally painting things that aren't necessary to be painted. But I need another arm, which means I need to file. I'm so sorry. Oh, you're fine. I bet it's right, 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 left, 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 left. I'm a freaking ding dong. <laughs> ah, it literally <laughs> says around the back. <laughs> Nothing is better than learning from experience, honestly. Because then you can teach others with authority. It's like, I've experienced this. I'm not speaking because I learned about it on the internet. Like I know what was what happened and what went wrong. I'm it's trying to say you failed. that my opinions I've formed by reading Reddit comments on the internet aren't fact. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we're done assembling our models, what you might notice is that there are some gaps in them. And the question is, is are they big enough to worry about filling? And so one is uh, on top of his head, uh, his carapace, and where, his, where it meets the fleshiness of his skull. Uh, there's a little gap there, and I filled mine, and uh, Nick here didn't fill his as a, like a means to compare. And I don't think that gap is big enough to worry about at all. Another one on the face, uh, where the two halves of the head come together, again, it's there. You could fill it. Once you got it painted and all nice and pretty, you're not really going to see it. I think that there are no gaps on this model worth really worrying about. So that's good news. So now we can move on to deciding a color scheme. And the first thing that I think we should do when thinking about a color scheme is thinking about a very simple background story of what these guys, what this guys, where these guys are from, what maybe what their goals are, what they, what they like to do, things like that, and that will inform so much of the artistic decisions that we want to make. I absolutely love the xenomorphs from the Alien series. I love the Zergs from Starcraft. I just love aliens in general. So Tyranids were just a natural choice for me in 40k they were the race that immediately called out to me i've always wanted to buy their models literally just to assemble and paint them we're really getting inspired by the alien franchise maybe like mm -hmm. a little bit of avp and like that like they're fighting on the temple at the end and i can't like... help but think of zergs i'm sorry with zergs. Starcraft. <laughs> no, that's, that's and i think of them like running through like uh like i guess what would be the uh the eldar like the equivalent of the Eldars here. Yes. Uh, like, they're like temples and stuff, you know what I mean? Like, oh. those kind of buildings is what I'm thinking of. Okay, you know this, what is, I mean? this is story in the making. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Force... Like, they're going through, like, the ruins that they've, like, destroyed these, like, Eldars. And, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so these guys are in the process. They just invaded an Eldar craft world. Maybe, okay. they've, maybe like they're this. before battle, maybe it's after battle. Maybe you want to put some Eldar bits on here, some heads. I have some. We can use some. Um, so that's a story. Okay, then you said you mentioned like warm colors. Okay, so what are you thinking? Do you want the light color to be the flesh? Well, okay, or the so carapace? so I do like warm colors, but the highlights can almost be those. What, what do you think? 
would be uh, my options for like a base tone for like the actual body of them. Because I know sure. you, you don't just want to like make it crazy, right? But I, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it has uh, if there are like specific colors that are more often used for Tyranids as their like base coat or their base color for their bodies. Anything goes. So for like light colors, you can use cream, like you see in here. You can use grays. You can use light blues. Uh, and then for the carapaces, you can use any vibrant tone you want. And you can also swap it around. The flesh can be the vibrant color, and the carapace right. can be the kind of more mm -hmm. matted, right. muted color. It doesn't really matter. I think what we want to start with is maybe what's your favorite color? Well, and that's what I'm thinking, right? So, like, I really want, like, reds and oranges. But do I want to make that the main portion of the body of the Tyranid? Or do I want it to be the highlights specifically? Here's what I think we should do. I think the carapace should be... Red mid -tone with orange highlights. Okay. So you can get both in one. And then the skin uh, should be, what do you think about like a, like almost like the skin is like fleshy and pink, like raw human muscle almost. So it looks kind of like nasty and like almost I, like. I like that idea too, just because missing like. missing a layer of skin on top. And they, they have like these exposed spots on them too that you can like, it kind of yeah. lends it to that as well. So like they just, they just shed some flesh. They're just <laughs> new out of, you know, and they, they're ready to rock. So okay, we're thinking orange and red on the shell. We're thinking maybe the skin can be a, a brighter, but maybe a little bit pinky. Mm -hmm. uh, and More then, fleshy. Yeah, yeah and then yeah. we want, do you want to have some fun with the claws? What if they were just jet obsidian black? In that would be Cause here's That'd the be concern. a nice contrast. Yeah, actually. Yeah, the concern is that if we add in another vibrant color, we're going to have orange, red, and say like green. That can tend to look a little gaudy if you have like too many. Clown. Right. Yeah, right. Like a little bit too much colors. That, that's my opinion. So if you go like that, it's almost like, like kind of injectors. Do, like, you do know? Eldars have blood? <laughs> Yeah, probably, yeah. sure. Oh, yeah, we're going to put some gore on these guys. Well, that's what I'm saying, is like, oh, yeah. got to put some, uh, yeah. So I like the idea of like the obsidian black then on the on the claws, and I like that a lot. All right, I love that idea. I love all of those. I think that creating the bases would be my favorite because you kind of have a lot of a lot of different ways you can go with it. You can kind of fit the base to the miniature and kind of give it your own spin, I guess. Okay, so we looked around in the various basing bits that I have here, and to recreate the... Eldar Temple look. We're going to use a few things. We're going to use Gamer Grass's Temple Ruins uh, here, and we're also going to use some of these little Eldar uh, bits and runes that came in an old GW kit uh, called the 40k Resin Basing Kit. And what we're going to do is we're going to glue these onto the base, and then we're going to fill the gaps in with dirt and maybe some like static tufts later on to imply that it's kind of maybe like more of a jungle environment. But for now, we're going to take some of these. Uh, ruins pieces and kind of clip them out to fit on our bases and just have fun kind of mixing and matching some bits. All right, so I didn't actually see that you found a piece like this. I kind of like this because it's like split in half. Yeah. Oh, there yeah. goes that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're all done assembling our bases. We have different bits of little temple ruins and uh, Eldar bits on there. We're going to go and prime them with uh, GW's Wraithbone for the contrast line. We'll be right back. All right, so we're outside to prime. Typically, that's where you go with aerosol cans if you're just getting into miniature painting. Um, and what you're going to do is you want to shake this uh, for about maybe like a minute each time to get it nicely even and distributed. And there's a lot of uh, speculation on the internet about priming outside when it's cold. Right now, it's about anywhere between 30 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And some people might think that's too cold, but it, it totally isn't. We're bringing these models outside from indoor they're at room temperature. This is at room temperature. We're going to be outside for 30 seconds, and then we're back inside. They'll cure in there. It's going to be fine. Nothing's going to happen. So with primer, it's pretty simple. I got it on a handle. I'm going to make uh, light dusting passes across the model. I'm never starting with the button on top of uh, the miniature. I start off of it. I drag it on. I let it go. So it's just that professional movement. <laughs> and I kind of just rotate yeah. around the model, trying to get every uh, every part of it. And I don't care if I get paint on the handle; it's plastic. Who cares? All right, so you really like put a whole lot on there, then, don't you? Really make yeah. sure you get it all covered. Yeah, for this uh, approach that we're doing for contrast paint, you want to get the thing pretty much totally covered. Staying about 10 centimeters away from the model. If it's more humid outside, then you're farther away. If it's drier outside, then you're closer. And the reason why is because you don't want the particles to dry mid-air and then attach to the model. Then it turns into a physical texture. I was going to say, it probably gets a little gritty. 
Yep, it's a little gritty. The thing I'm most scared about in the painting process is just sucking in general, honestly. <laughs> it's so difficult for me to get past my barrier of trying to be a perfectionist with everything that I do. It's so hard to commit to actually painting a model when I know that my first probably large number of attempts are gonna be absolute crap. I try so hard to be perfect with everything that I do that it kind of stops me, it prevents me from actually painting models, unfortunately. And that's why I was too scared to paint some of the ones that I've already had. One big time saving technique we're gonna leverage in this paint job is using contrast paint. Contrast paint is a wash, which is to say that it will settle in the recesses and be most intense there, and everywhere else it will just tint the surface of color. So it'll give us detail and also give us a tone in one step. And contrast paint is a special kind of wash in that it's heavily pigmented, meaning that it will color the surface more than your traditional wash. And we're gonna use it for the flesh on the model. So one thing you might not know about is like, okay, I have a, I have a pink, because we wanted to do pink flesh, right? right? I don't know how pink this is gonna be. Well, so as a testing step, I'm going to thin it a little bit with uh, contrast medium. Okay. That'll make it weaker, and then if I do need to apply another layer, I can, but it's harder to go you know, backwards mm -hmm. than it is to make it more intense. Obviously, yeah. So I'll start out with a 50-50 mixture, and I'll, I'll mix up enough for all of us to use. So is it is it the exact same texture as a wash, or is it slightly thicker? I w <laughs> uh, in terms of consistency, maybe it's a little bit thicker. With uh, a pretty loaded up brush, I'm gonna start to paint on to the skin areas. Now it's going to start to naturally sink into the recesses, giving you definition in between the joints and things like that. Also while sim simultaneously coloring the flesh tone. And you kind of have to pay attention to where it's pooling. Sometimes it pools in like awkward areas and you want to make sure you don't let it pool in flat areas. Then it kind of gets a little like uh, washy. Right. So, for instance, so you want to spread it out when it's... Like this little dot right here is uh, is awkward. So I'm going to kind of uh, yeah, soak it up. Okay. Yeah. But you kind of got to act a little fast because if you don't act fast enough, uh, then the shit will dry and then when you pull it off then you'll make a little tide mark and that's Not what we want So like wash apart Dab it off soak up areas that look a little strange Maybe right here at the top And don't be don't be concerned about getting any of the wash on the shell or, or any other part since this is the first step in the painting process It can be a little messy. I feel like there's almost a amount of carelessness you need to have with a wash because it kind of just adds to the randomness of, of like how it kind of pools. You can certainly be more aggressive with a wash than you can other paints. Like you load up more wash into your brush than you might like normal paint. That's definitely true. So is this kind of the same as paint where if you try and like move it around as it's drying it'll it clump up and make a texture? Weird. Yes. So sometimes if it's dried in a little pool, the edges of the pool will be dry, but the center won't. And mm -hmm. so if you soak it up, you'll be left with a ring. So that's why I said wash each part one at a time and then look for all the weird pooling areas and then uh, move on to the next part. But that's what we're looking for, something like that, nice fleshy and pink. Make sure to sponge up all the areas where it's pooling in awkward spots and then we'd uh, the flesh is done. You can oh, add more to it if you want. You can add more highlights, but or you can just be happy. I mean, with I think this. that looks actually fantastic just with the one coat you've got there. It's kind of surprising to me that it turned out that well just from one. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is that the paint job will look better the more stuff we paint. Mm -hmm. When we yeah. paint the red shell, when we paint the black claws, it's gonna it's gonna be like, whoa, this is this is evolving. Right. The part I am least looking forward to is painting the eyes. I feel like it requires a very steady hand, and those I do not have. As the footage will reveal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on to painting the carapace, and we're going to use Mephiston Red for the base coat. And today we're all using wet palettes. Wet palettes are super basic tools. Basically, the sponge has moisture in it. The paper on top is porous, so the water from the sponge uh, gets sucked into the paint through osmosis and keeps it nice and wet, so your paint isn't drying constantly, because acrylic paint likes to dry really fast. So this will help us make our hobby time a little bit better. So the brushes that you used for the washing, the cruddy brushes, use that brush to uh, get paint out of the jar and onto your palette, um, just a little bit. And then also with the same brush, you're gonna get some water 
and you're going to mix it into uh, your paint. Now there is a lot of information on the internet about uh, what kind of consistency you want to shoot for. Like, this is a huge question. How do you thin your paints? A lot of times people say you want to shoot for the consistency of melted ice cream. Um, so like uh, not as thin as milk, not as thick as mayo, you know, somewhere in between. Essentially what you want, what you're looking for with your brush when you uh, do a stroke, is that it comes off of your brush nicely. You're not fighting it. There are no brush strokes. The paint settles immediately, but it's not like a wash. It's not trying to settle into the recesses. It's not trying to run away. It's staying where you put it and it's not creating brush strokes. I'm gonna drag constantly so I have no brush strokes. I might need two coats of this because covering over white or cream in this case uh, is kind of hard. No brush strokes. I'm not struggling at all. The paint's coming right off my bristles. It's nice and easy. And I will need two coats of this because I can see that this is not the full darkness that Mephiston Red is supposed to be. I need to channel my inner Scott. Do the old we'll suck. We'll them out. suck and twist. You can use the back of the brush to mix the paint. Curtis just asked what should you use to mix it. If you're using the cruddy brush, just use the bristles. Okay. It, yeah, it's a little bit easier in that case. When you apply a layer of paint, you have about 20 seconds to mess with it before it starts to dry. After about 20 seconds, this is just a rule of thumb, uh, let it be, let it dry. And then if it's not fully covering what you want to cover, then you can come back to it later with another coat. Should I try to consistently paint in the same direction or else it like makes the texture look slightly different? Yeah, you can, but hopefully you're not really seeing any brush strokes in what you're doing. Right. And the paint is kind of like leveling itself almost immediately. So pumped to see how this turns out. And it's so simple. It's so fast. I feel like a fucking like infomercial. This scheme is quick and it's so easy for $9.99. You can call right now. Easy 69 payments. Give me your credit card. Game over. I'm losing money not buying this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now with our base coat done on our Hormigant, we're gonna start to paint the carapace. And we're gonna do it in a very classic way that a lot of tiered players do. And that is going to be like with kind of like striations and lines. So with a slightly brighter uh, red color called Evil Sun Scarlet, we're gonna get our paint loaded up. And it's thinned exactly the same amount as the base coat was. And what we're gonna do is we're essentially gonna do layering, but we're gonna do it with kind of a pattern. So we're just gonna pull the brush back toward uh, the end. Uh, and really the only place you don't wanna get paint is in the recess, the area closest to where the next part of the shell begins. Other than the recesses, am I coating the entirety of the surface? Yeah, coating in like air quotation marks because you're like striping it almost. Okay. You're doing like just the very tip of your brush, is that right? Exactly, I'm doing the very tip of my brush. The the more I favor, or the more I use the tip of the brush, the sharper the line is going to be, the more definition I'm gonna get in my stripes. You might ask why we're using GW paint as opposed to some other brand. And the reason why I'm favoring GW is because it's one of the most satin paint ranges. The paint is the shiniest. And I think for beginner painters, a shinier paint, especially, is a little bit more forgiving than yeah. uh, something like a matte paint. It definitely feels easier to hide little mistakes I make. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now that we've finished doing some very subtle stripes on the red, we're going to do one last layer of stripes with orange. We're using a very similar consistency to last time, but this time instead of having the stripe go all the way up to the recess, we're going to start kind of maybe like midway in the carapace okay. and drag it down yeah, to true. the end. So we're getting kind of a transition build up with our stripes. Just put a very small amount of paint in your brush, not a lot. I can't get those nice thin lines like you get. I don't think I have quite the control. It could be that, yeah. It could be the brush. It's uh, It comes down to like the amount of pressure you apply because the more you push the brush down on the surface, the more it starts to fan out. We've fully hided our shells, and now we're gonna move on to the claws. And we're gonna use a glossy black, Vallejo Game Color Black. Abaddon Black from GW also works just fine. And we're gonna paint the entire thing black, and really you can just stop right there once it's glossy, because on the tabletop, the light's gonna reflect off of it, and it's gonna look like it has highlights on it. 
You could go extra and do some highlights, or you could just keep it right there. We'll decide once we've done that. But for now, we're just going to do, do a base coat of black on all of the claws, on the feet, and on the hands, and stuff like that. A lot of painting is back and forth. So, like, if you put paint in and then make a mistake, uh, it's fine to kind of go back with another paint and fix it again. Then you might need to go back and forth and fix it again. That even happens to me a lot with a lot of things that I try. So, definitely a normal thing. All right, we've base coated the claws, and the last thing we have to do is we want to paint the eyes a nice, vibrant color. But we're also going to do a little extra credit. Uh, so we're going to paint the eyes a green, which is a nice spot color that will contrast nicely with the red. But also we're going to very sparingly edge highlight some of the more predominant claws with that same green. Ideally. Ideally. <laughs> no practice. one's going to mess up. <laughs> See right. how this goes in practice. Uh, uh. <laughs> so obviously these, these, these claws have very nice edges to them. And so the trick is just to run the edge of the paintbrush along the edge of the detail. Just like that. Can you just do mine? <laughs> nope. I'm prepared to mess everything that I've done up. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, just with the edge highlight. He's going to slip and get green everywhere. Uh, the nerves, dude, the nerves. All right, give me the pro advice for the eyeball. Just go in there, just jab it as hard as I can. So here's the pro advice. You want to make sure you're approaching it from like the right angle. So like coming from behind the eye is not the right move because you're going to get paint all up on this part right here. Right. Coming from the front is definitely the right move. You want a nice sharp brush and how you can do that is by getting some paint on your tip, spiraling it on your finger and then you have a nice sharp tip. Come from the right angle. Make sure you have all four points of contact with your elbows, your two wrists, and they join together in the middle. Hold your breath. Yeah, can you tell me and just that? dab it a little bit. And then once you dab it a little bit, you know, back up, you'd be like, hmm, was that good enough or do I want more green in there? Are you trying to maybe just do like a pupil or the entire eye in there? I'm gonna do just the raised part so the lower part stays pink, like a dark pink. Yes. Taking advantage of that, that like oh. recess shade. Just take your time. Maybe hold your breath. <laughs> I've been holding my breath for the past 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now that we've edge highlighted and painted the eyes green, uh, the model itself is done and we need to paint the base still, but also we want to do some special effects to the model. These are things that are pretty easy to do, aren't really painterly things that really kind of up the, the look of our model. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add some blood to the blades. They won't show up very nicely on the black, but it'll still look pretty cool, I think. And then finally, we're going to use some Uhu glue to add some stretchy, nasty slime on some guys that have the mouth open and like maybe we can do it in between the claws and in between the chest and his chin and things like that. It'll be like really dribbly. So we'll start with the Uhu glue and this stuff uh, starts to cure like the moment it leaves its bottle. So you kind of you kind of got to go pretty fast with it. It's very sticky and very stretchy. So I'm going to get a little bit of it out. Close it, and then grab it. You see how it stretches? Yeah. So I'm gonna attach it right there. Maybe go down there, maybe go over here. Go back right there. And you can really like grab it and like make webs with it. And oh my stuff. gosh. <laughs> it actually wild. makes them look like, like slimy. nasty, slimy aliens, yeah. Yeah. Or as not oh. hardcore as you want. And I think that's where I'm going to stop, right there. That's pretty wild. You know, it's kind of like a taste thing. <clears throat> and so is it uh, Here, kind of like a pretty sensitive material even after it's dried? If, like, yeah. if you don't be careful with your model, you might break it at exactly. some point. Yeah. yeah. So the best way to transport this maybe wouldn't be in a movement tray. It would be with a magnet on the bottom on like a metal tray. So it's just standing. Right. Not touching it has no chance else. of like falling over or anything. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I, I this really already, like the effect that that has on it. Oh my God. I think this yeah. is already cured. Like I just took something. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And it's, it's already done. It's dead. Here, just put it, put it on this hard palette right wild. here. And then the last thing we're going to do is just a little bit of blood. I'm going to get just a big old chunk of blood here. Just a little bit of gore. Yeah, but you're kind of like globbing it on more, right? Yeah. So it's like th uh, like a thick glob of blood as opposed to just like a layer of paint. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, we've added the special effects to the model. Now we're going to paint the base. Because we took a contrast paint approach to this model, we're also going to take advantage of that for the base because we already have the nice undercoat there. We're going to paint the ruins, the temple parts, with a shade, seraphim sepia, a sepia wash of any kind. And then we're going to paint the dirt around with wild wood 
And we're going to apply them both at the same time. Don't worry about them mixing and matching. That's totally OK if they kind of touch and start to mix a little bit, because some of the dirt would get onto the ruins and stuff like that. Yeah. And then once that painting is done uh, and it's all dry, we'll stick a tuft on and then paint the base room black. And that is our nid complete. And then are we going to use the more coarse brush again for this? Yeah, sure. Use the old cruddy brush. Okay. Does it matter if I get it on the rim? Oh, uh, the base room? Yeah. No, not at all. Okay. Because I'm assuming we're coming in after that and giving it a nice crisp black line. You fucking better believe we're getting into the black <laughs> rim, mud. There are many ways to paint bases. Doing a base coat and then dry brushing is a totally valid approach. A base coating and a dry brush and some washing, very valid approach. We're approaching the end here. And what I just did was I took some tufts and I tore Ooh. them up into much smaller tufts because most tufts that come in the pre-packaging, they're a little too large. So I took them and made them very small. And now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put some super glue down on the lid here. And I'm going to sneak them in between the little rocks. Uh, like some foliage is oh. growing up in between the rocks. I love that. Like that. It yeah. really helps make it look like more natural. Yeah. Not like such a stark difference between the rocks and then just the ground. Yeah, like nature is kind of taking over again. After our session, I will say that I think it'll be a lot easier for me to finish the unit that I've already started because I've already got a paint scheme picked out for I've already got all the steps kind of laid out, everything that we had done. I can just kind of replicate for all the rest of them. And I really want to see them actually completed and the entire brew together. And I would hope that it's going to help me actually pick a scheme and start working on my other models too because I would really love to actually see them painted because I've got so many of them assembled and ready to go. I feel a lot more confident. Just going through it, I, I learned a lot from it, and I kind of have like the different stages you can go through. You kind of start on a very generic, large scale, and you get a lot of color down, then you can kind of go back, touch it up. So, you know, anything you do isn't really finals, because you can always go back and just cover it up again, and you can just kind of make little tweaks as you go. And I feel very confident that I could take a model and make something that I'd be fairly happy with. Okay, with painting the base rim, we have finished three beautiful looking tuner nids that look wonderful together. Hopefully, uh, this scheme is going to work for you and your future army. We'll see about that. Hopefully, the information and the questions asked in this video are helpful to you. If you guys like the video and you want to support me, I have several ways you can do it. Namely, a Patreon campaign with a bunch of fun rewards, like a Discord server where you and I can hang out a day of the week and chat about your miniature painting projects, or how Tyranids are the worst race in 40k. <laughs> you would say such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> you can also buy hobby equipment that I recommend down in the description, and also buy things like the model that I produce called the Duchess and the digital course for it. Subscribe or die! And most importantly, don't forget to paint my medals! <laughs>